Welcome to my talk, which is called Technology is Not Neutral, a short guide to technology ethics, which is also the title of my book, which was published in February. And I believe is available here at the bookshop in case anyone is interested in seeing more. So I will get into um, the sort of meaty argument of the book, but I wrote it because I have worked in technology for over 20 years and this kind of book did not exist when I started out and I deeply wish that it had been because I have both witnessed many horrific things and been part of things that in retrospect were not great. Um, it definitely could have been better. So what I wanted to do now that I'm in my mid 40s was package up my learnings and also all of the research that I've done because I'm now a professional researcher and pass it on to the next generation but also to the public. So I presented this book at the Artificial Intelligence All-Party Parliamentary Group in Parliament on the 4th of July, which as an American was a little bit of a winky joke. Um, I've taken it, I'm taking it rather to Scotland where we'll be talking about it at Datafest and hopefully to the devolved government there and to Wales. It's very much a book that's to help not just technologists, but journalists, parents, teachers, lawmakers, regulators, everyone who might have a dog in this fight, to quote former President Harry S. Truman. Um, so it's accessible. You don't have to be a technologist. There is no code in it. There are no scary computer architecture graphics. It's really more about how humans use technology and why that's such a problematic concept and has been pretty much since we invented our first tools. So without further ado, we're gonna give a little overview, and if we have time, uh, we'll go through a really powerful example because Britain is a world leader for all the wrong reasons in biometric and surveillance technologies. And it's what I really went deep on in the book to give a case study, because when we normally think of surveillance technology as a dystopian argument, we point to China. And I was like, why point to China? Well, we can just look right here at home. So you can see the tone of where this chat will go. Very, very quickly, I just wanted to kind of introduce myself. So I've worked in the private sector mainly, but I also have had training and a career as a researcher, largely in political risk and technology. And over the years, the two of those things have merged. Technology has become increasingly political in terms of the public eye uh, and vice versa. So American by birth, uh, French later on. There's a lot of French stuff in the book, and obviously it's a philosophy book. So. The Anglo-Saxon world doesn't really train its young people in philosophy, but the French do. So if you're a French student, you're going to be doing eight hours of philosophy every week in high school. My American upbringing, I had zero. So it's quite hard to talk about technology ethics if you have no training in philosophy, which I have a conspiracy theory about that if you keep people ignorant on philosophy, then they can't really be the critical thinkers that perhaps that we need them to be. And then I came to the UK in 1998 became a citizen in 2000 and thus wanted to write a book that really showcased the United Kingdom because again, so many tech discussions are either about the United States and Silicon Valley or about China. But in fact, so much that's important about tech is happening here in Europe. So it's a little bit different. The reason I'm over there with the BBC mic is that I often do radio and the world service. So if you're ever up between one and two in the morning, God help you if you are, but you might hear my dulcet tones talking about politics and tech. So. That's enough of that. Um, and this is the book, obviously. Uh, little cheeky reference, actually, I should say. So we debated a lot the cover there. I wanted to have a technology that would be recognizable anywhere in the world. So we picked the smartphone, such a powerful one. I was super nervous about putting Satan on the cover, largely because that was not my dream as a first time writer to put a book out with that. <laughs> also coming from the States, as you know, we like to ban books a lot. People get very serious about their religion there. Um, it just made me a bit nervous. So on the back cover, it's the same image, but it's an angel. To be fair, it's play with the technology is not neutral. So I didn't want to demonize any tech workers here who feel like, God damn, I'm trying to save the world and you make me out to be Satan. I know, I feel your pain. Um, and you're an angel on the back cover. So what is it? We have Ada Lovelace, Lady Lovelace, you may recognize here on the left, and we have Socrates here on the right. And I just wanted to sort of give ourselves a bit of a visual reference for, th for those who are more visual thinkers. Ada Lovelace is thought of as the world's first computer programmer. She worked with Charles Babbage. Um, he had her look over one of his manuscripts. She actually retranslated it. It had been translated into Italian. He asked her to translate it back into English. And then she added something like 19,000 notes of like extra thoughts. And her extra thoughts were, of course, brilliant. But they were both kind of ahead of their time. And 
their writings and inventions kind of fell into a bit of obsolescence really and a bit hidden until Alan Turing came along, read her notes and was like, this is brilliant. And of course he's the founder or one of the founders of artificial intelligence. So we trace the origins of computer programming back to her. Again, another really nice reason to talk about the UK's role in technology. And of course I wanted to put Socrates on, but I've presented this to a few places and I take the point, this is very Western centric. And of course technology is global and philosophy is global. Every culture on earth has had philosophy for thousands of years and we could put someone besides an old white man like Socrates if we wanted, we could have Confucius, we could have Buddha, we could talk about any number of people who could hold the philosophy space. So I just wanted to acknowledge that critique early on. The problem statement, because like all good technologists, you have to decide when you're going to build something, what is the problem we're trying to solve? What options do we have for solving it? How will we know if we've solved it or not? How do we define success? What are the metrics to measure that? And then do we want to be able to do any benchmarking because potentially other people are trying to solve it too? So how do we know whose solution is the most beneficial or the least harmful or vice versa? So the problem statement I, I sort of came up with and had on my wall for the four years I was writing this was how we can create and use technologies so that they deliver maximum benefit and minimum harm. And again, a note to um, people who know their British philosophy, that's from utilitarianism, which originates here in this country. So there's a lot, I've realized as an immigrant that the British way of thinking has infused my American mind. Uh, it's a lot, a lot of British thinking in this book, very practical. So this is a scary slide. This is just for people who like to look at um, slide decks later. I'm really happy to share this. If anyone wants it, I will very happily email it out. And I just put it in because, again, I give this to lots of people who have never studied philosophy and they're like, just to tell them, <laughs> where are you on the map of the, of the mind? Philosophy has six branches, largely. We could make this far more complicated, but this is like your minimum viable philosophy slide. Okay, philosophy ethics is where we are with technology ethics, but you can have a much more powerful discussion if you're at least aware of the other five branches. So this is not something to get scary about or be like, oh my God, she's gonna talk to us about the, the small print. I'm not, it's just there for people who like to read or wanna know more. But it's just kind of like the questions, you know, how should people act? What do people think is right? How do we take moral knowledge and put it into practice and operationalize it? What does right even mean? And that can sound really abstract, but I was recently talking with DeepMind, also a British company based here in London, artificial intelligence world leader, which was recently acquired by Google a few years ago for I think around $400 million, not too shabby. They have an operational ethics team. So this is not just something for white papers or books or discussion groups. There are companies out there who are looking at ethics and technology ethics and building it into their business practices. So it's just to be aware of that. If this is like boring, ignore that slide. But for some people, they like it. So that's great. What the hell does any of this have to do with technology? For those of you like hardcore coders or designers in the room might be like, this is a lot for 10 a.m. and I am with you. So the first concept to understand is technology ethics is happening all around you. So even if you are not tuned into this or if you don't think it's important or you don't care, may I rest your mind at ease that there are many people who are working on this and you are living in their world. You may not know that, but hopefully this will show you a little bit. If you choose to ignore it or to not take a stand on it, that's fine, but that's actually still a position. It's kind of one of those things that once you become aware of it, you can't unsee it. And my goal with this talk is not to get you to agree with me or disagree with me on anything. It's simply to hopefully raise some awareness and get you thinking about it a bit in, a, in an interesting way for you as a citizen as a, and as a consumer. My argument is that there's no such thing as being neutral on technology ethics. That is a very controversial position. We will acknowledge the other side of that debate. There are lots of very intelligent people who would totally think I'm wrong and think technology is neutral. Some of them may be in this room. So we'll take a look and see why. Because I trained as a historian of France, and France is a really big part of my sort of intellectual laboratory, I felt it was important to have an obligatory quote from a French philosopher, and I indeed had this on my wall while I was writing, because I loved it. Um, it just keeps things in mind when you're coming up with solutions, that when you invent the ship, you create the shipwreck. The plane, the plane crash, electricity, 
electrocution. It's just a really nice, simple way of reminding you that anytime you're putting something into the world, there will be like a negative space or, or just the potentiality for that. And just to be aware of it. Every technology carries with it its own negativity that's invented at the same time as technical progress. That is like very humbling. I feel like if every technologist sort of had that and was brushing their teeth every morning while they looked at that, you might go about your day a bit differently. And it's hard because you're under so much pressure a lot of the time or you're working with clients who have budgets and a very specific MO, goal of what they want to do. You don't always have time to, to make ethics part of your process. And I hope that this will help people think about why that's worthwhile. But first, experts who think that technology is neutral. And again, this is a very powerful view. Lots of people, particularly in the United States and in Silicon Valley, like to have it. And I think it's because in my country, when we talk about things like responsibility, we instantly think about liability, and then we think about who we can sue. Right? So Americans have like a very specific conception of holding people and power to account. Right? It's like, take them to court. It's like <laughs> probably one of our biggest phrases. And I don't know if that's necessarily true for the rest of the world. So we're a litigious people. So this, this argument exists in that context. If you can say that technology is neutral, then you're not responsible for what happens with it, right? It's the whole guns don't kill people, people kill people argument, which of course is very interesting because I can kill a lot more people with an AK-15 than I can a revolver or a shotgun. So like, even the example of the technology there is not neutral. A, a gun is not a gun is not a gun. They're different. And certain people have training to use those things and certain people don't or have access to them or not. So it's like instantly you can complicate even something like guns don't kill people, people kill people. This matters because now we're talking about things like artificial intelligence and weapons that can kill without a human being involved. So if you're going to build that system and places like MOD in this country will be looking at that, DOD in the United States, you want to have that discussion of if it isn't guns don't kill people, people kill people, well, what happens when you take a human out of the loop? Who's responsible then? The person who codes it? The person who builds it? The investors who fund it? What if that's your pension fund that's investing in that? Are you responsible for it, right? So it gets rough, it's super messy, by the way. Like, don't leave this talk thinking that you're gonna have any easy answers. You'll just have a migraine. I have earned these forehead wrinkles. <laughs> so, moving on to the people who think it is neutral. So Gary Kasparov, I'm sure known to many people here, chess grandmaster, wrote a book called Deep Thinking, which I really recommend reading, if only for the amazing fact that he wrote an entire book about AI and only mentions women twice, one of whom is his mother. <laughs> so that was, that was a painful 200-something pages for me. Uh, tech is agnostic, it amplifies us. Ethical AI is like ethical electricity. So he tweeted that, I follow him on Twitter, I really admire him, and I was like, okay, I'm, I'm with him. So your experience of plugging in your phone and using some electricity to charge up your phone should hopefully be the same as yours, as long as everybody's routers are the same and nobody's like blowing up their phone. If you take your phone and try and do it in Italy, you might have a problem because their electricity is different. But in theory, electricity should be the same for everyone in this room. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.